Well, 
to each point x, we are associating a probability distribution, the probability of the true location of the particle, given that we think it is at x. So to each point, we associate a probability distribution. What this does is it tells you that this space that we're talking about is now a statistical manifold. And statistical manifolds have a metric, have distance. It is legitimate to associate a, a distance to such a space. Let's see how we proceed. We will use information geometry to define that distance. We will say, well, suppose you have a point there. Suppose you have another point there. Well, I really don't learn. Right? And so this is what allows us to define a distance between them. The distance is given by a metric tensor. This is essentially Pythagoras theorem in a curved space. Um, I'm summing over a little bit in this figure. Where this metric tensor is given by some complicated expression that involves derivatives of this type of thing. One of the remarkable things about this metric tensor is that it is essentially unique. Uh, one can show that if you're really talking about probability distributions, you don't have much freedom about what metric tensors you're going to use. You may perhaps uh, have freedom to pick the order of units by changing an order of constant, but apart from the choice of units, you're, you're, you, you, you don't, there isn't much you can do. Very good. So what we have to do is very simple. What we have to do is we need a prescription to figure out what the probability distribution for each one of these two dots is, for each one of those points, we plug it there, and we're done. So let's get to it. Why was there a minus sign in front of the interval? Oh, that's because uh, that's because sometimes I make stupid errors. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that can really derail the audience because you're going to stop thinking for about three or four minutes. What on earth is a minus sign, and you missed all the other interesting things that I was saying in the web. <laughs> so I'm very sorry. Thank you for noticing. That's, that's a typo. Good. Yes, how are you going to have that? Anyway, very good. So we're going to use Manson to, to assign that probability distribution, and from there we find the metric. And in principle, you say, OK, that's trivial. Let's do it. Uh, we're going to impose that the probability for the true position on the average, the expected value is some value, is center, x. And we're going to impose something uh, for the variance covariance matrix. So this, one would think, is a perfectly trivial application of the method of maximum entropy. Maximum entropy is such those constraints, you're done. Problem. The problem is something that is not with the method of maximum entropy. The problem is that, in principle, coordinates are not supposed to carry any information. Coordinates are just uh, are, are labels you attach to points, and just like you say, you can say anything in, in well, you can meaningfully use Cartesian coordinates to solve a problem, or you can use spherical coordinates, and in principle, that should be make the problem more difficult, but in principle, you should reach the same conclusions. The problem is that if you try to change coordinates from coordinates with indices, super indices i, to, co to new coordinates with a, so, so this is the old coordinates to new coordinates, what we find is that the expected value of a function is not the function of the expected value. That's, that's, we know that, right? The, the, these things do not commute the function of the expectation. So even if we impose that constraint in one set of coordinates, the i coordinates, when you change the new coordinates, they're going to be valid. So this, this sort of violates one of the crucial premises about what we mean by space and how we use coordinates to describe space, namely that there is no preferred coordinate frame. You can change coordinates in any way you want. The names we use for the points should not matter. So it's not so straightforward now. To, to use the method of maximum entropy because it loses this crucial insight of Einstein that uh, it should maintain covariance. So how do we work this problem around? Well, the problem was that this coordinate space, this coordinates on a curved space, uh, cannot be Cartesian because the space itself is curved. If the space were flat, you would be able to choose Cartesian coordinates. But if it's curved, you, you can't. The measure coordinates is, is, is well, 
the best system of all this is not uh, Cartesian. So solution, we're going to use it makes sense, but we're going to use it on the tangent spaces. If you have a curved space, the curved space might be curved, but if you look at the tangent at any point, those spaces are flat. So my trick is going to be use my accent on those flat spaces and then find a clever way to translate those probability distributions into or onto the curved space itself. So as you can see that this is it makes sense, it's all that yes, but this is a technical problem. So my talk is gonna have two 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 acts. Uh, the first act is the technical problem of cutting out these steps. And this, this is, well, I find it very exciting because it took me a long while to figure out these trivial steps, right? For me, it's very exciting. You may be bored to them and say, oh gosh, what is this guy doing with all this wacky mathematics? Okay, that's the, the first part. Once I succeed, I'm going to point out uh, a few really, really interesting features of what such a space might look like, what kind of physics you could start looking at, start extracting from, from such a model. And that, that may be more interesting. Anyway, in order to project that probability distribution that I have on the natural spaces onto the curved space, I need a trick. The trick is called, in mathematics, the exponential map. And it goes like this. Suppose you have a curved space. Pick a point. At that point, you can consider a vector. Now, vectors, if you have a curved space, a vector is straight. It doesn't fit on the space. Really, truly, a vector is, is, is contained in the tangent space. In fact, that's the way one defines a tangent space. It's the set of all vectors at a location. So now if I imagine the geodesic, the straight line that goes through that, that <coughs> complex with tangent vector y, I can do a really interesting construction now because geodesics can be described by a parameter. They are fine parameter, or we call it lambda. And if you follow the parameter up to where the parameter here, the lambda is equal to zero, there is lambda equal to one, that point I'm going to give it coordinates. The, the coordinates for that point, I'm going to call them x plus y. Now this is a very, very clever choice of coordinates. It has lots of, of uh, uh, inter very interesting properties. What it allows me to do is to say to each, to each point on the tangent plane, I can associate a point on the curved space. That is called the exponential map. Such coordinates are not new. They're called Riemann normal coordinates. So they go back to 1850 or 1860. This is something that was happening a long time ago. This map is like truly clever, and that's what I'm going to be using to transform a probability distribution on the space to a probability distribution on the space of interest. The probability distribution might be Gaussian over here, nice, Gaussian, Maxent, and all that. By the time I project it down, it can be a mess. But that's all right. I know exactly how to do the calculation. Very good. Okay, we've got procedure. This is the, 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 num the number of steps that I do in order to assign a metric to this statistical manifold. Start with some arbitrary coordinates and choose a positive definite tensor. This is the guy that's going to serve as the variance covariance matrix for, for the, the, the width, the, the, the blurring of the spatial points. Change coordinates now, those coordinates were arbitrary. Change coordinates so that at the point of interest, x, this is just like Cartesian coordinates, uh, axis, uh, uh, right angles, and all of that, uh, with the derivative being zero, so that it doesn't change uh, for small displacement. Uh, is there a positive definite if that's the inverse that you have the indices upstairs? Yes, this, uh, oh, oh, very good, very good. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this are the indices upstairs and downstairs are inverses of each other. Yes. And by positive definite, what I mean is that if you were to multiply this by two vectors, 
for any event that you already have something for them. Well, so you change coordinates. Uh, if this were a metric tensor, okay, 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 I didn't say this, but if this were a metric tensor, uh, these, these I got called normal coordinates. You can always choose coordinates of such that that happens. Now, find the geodesics and the passing through the vortex as if this were a metric tensor. As if it were, you can always do that with tangent parts. So find those geodesics, you see, I'm preparing the, 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 the the room here for doing the exponential math. Next, on the tangent, spa uh, tangent space, apply maximetry to assign a probability distribution in the tangent space. You impose that on the average, you're going to be at the center of the tangent space, and impose as variance covariant matrix the correlation that we had before in these new interesting coordinates. So nice in Cartesian. So this is a very simple problem. The solution is just the Gaussian, where, <coughs> where the Lagrange multipliers that appear here are precisely the inverse of that. So this is the identity matrix. That's the identity matrix too. So the Lagrange multipliers here are very trivial. Very good. Next step. Use the max the exponential map to map this probability distribution on the tangent space onto the curve space. It's actually a very trivial substitution and the answer is because of well because of the particular properties of those coordinates, the answer is also Gaussian. So it's very interesting that if you are in the curve space and you choose Riemann normal coordinates at that point, the answer is Gaussian. Where this 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 here is the y that appears there, that this here is the y that appears there, and those others are the same, which is the same. So the transformation is actually very simple. So this is the terms of the probability distribution we have in this Riemann normal coordinates. Now we calculate the information metric. Now the information metric for a Gaussian is the most beautiful thing there is. It's the identity, it's Cartesian, it's very nice. In fact, this is the this is the fact that 20 or 25 years ago led me to start studying Maxent seriously. I wanted to understand the metric, the geometry that we find in our kitchens, not in the inside of that hole. That that's that could be easy, could be difficult, whatever. I wanted to understand why you can do things like this and make sense of this, of, of this structure that we see in our kitchen. What this shows me is that if you have probability distributions of a certain type, Gaussians, Gaussians are the most obvious thing to have. The, the trivial probability distributions that you obtain from central limit theorems. If you do not know what's going on at the level of superstrings or whatever, what would you expect is going on at a much bigger scale? Central limit theorems, think of the Gaussian. So, if you pick Gaussians, the metric that you obtain is the Euclidean metric that we have in our kitchen. It's an experimental result of some type, right? You're sort of predicting Pythagoras theorem. Let us proceed. This is in these very special coordinates, Riemann normal coordinates. Nothing prevents us, of course, from transforming back to the original coordinates that we started with, in which case the delta, the Cartesian metric here, the Euclidean metric, gets transformed back into a generic metric. So the indices are changed to a metric, which is the inverse of the old correlation matrix. So, so this is the procedure in which I'm taking care to, to show that uh, I can apply the method maximetry on flat spaces so that I can actually maintain covariance in the whole procedure. Very good. So, conclusion. The metric is a statistical concept. It happens to be the inverse of the covariance covariance matrix. In fact, the inverse of the variance covariance matrix is the Lagrange multipliers in those probability distributions. So this is kind of interesting. Yet again, 
in physics, we find that physically relevant quantities are recognized multipliers. Perhaps the first example of beta in the distribution, right? That you get a Lagrange multiplier that is associated with temperature. What we get here is Lagrange multipliers, and they are associated to the metric of space. Uh, oh, I don't type over there. Now, one of the things that's sort of amusing with the type of space that I'm generating in this way is that these spaces are, are sort of special. When people talk about quantum gravity, you might have heard that the expectation is that space in quantum gravity is going to be incredibly irregular. It's going to be all over the place. The space here is smooth, but if you put quantum fluctuations, the space is going to be a complete mess. In this case, it's going to be just the opposite. Space is going to be very, very smooth because since these points have a size, it makes no sense have curvatures that are larger than the local uncertainty. You can't bend one of these points. Uh, so, so at best, the, 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 the sharpest similarities you can attain are given by this uncertainty. So it seems to me that these spaces would be much more smooth than uh, the people normally expect. Is this unreasonable? Yeah. Now, imagine that you have a gas. At high temperature, the molecules are doing a complete mess, right? And they're going fast and it's all over the place, doing all sorts of things. And yet, when I try to describe statistically the probability distribution that describes a gas at high temperature, beta, or the temperature, is incredibly smooth. So the fact that these spaces look very smooth is because I'm talking about the Lagrange multipliers are sort of smooth, even though these uh, Y variables can actually do something really wide. Discussion. OK, second part of the talk. Fabian is very good. Uh, I have to point out that so some of these, uh, of, the, of the features that emerge naturally from this particular model of space are, are, are strange. First thing, the distance is dimensionless. Uh, suppose that I have distance, here is the metric tensor, and of course I have to do my Pythagoras theory in distance by adding or the squares and all that, so this is what distance would look like. But if you look here, this piece here, that's dimensionless, this is probability per unit volume, that volume, no, no, dimensionless. Whatever is going on with these units down here gets cancelled by the units up there. This is a log, no units, or units cancelled out. This is dimensionless. So it is true that I've come up with an information geometry of this space, but is this a geometry of space? Because after all, what on earth is a dimensionless distance? Shouldn't the distance have units of distance? <laughs> when you actually look more carefully at what it is a type of field, then what you find is that this DL is distance, but it is measured in the units of the local uncertainty. <coughs> so the moment that these points have a size, this is a natural unit to measure distances. You're essentially counting distinguishable points. Very good. But this is very weird for many reasons. <laughs> if the units of distance are the local uncertainty, how do I know that the local uncertainty here is the same as the local uncertainty there? How can I compare distant uncertainties? If you cannot compare distant uncertainties, how can you measure the length of a curve, right? How can you say this is 3 meters and that is 3 meters too, so I've added to 6 meters? How, how, how can you do that? You can't. So information geometry is not quite the geometry we expect in our kitchens. So, so it's in telling you and I a little bit. It's a good line. <laughs> Information geometry gives not the geometry of space, it gives its conformal geometry. It gives the geometry it's up to scale, local scale transformations. If you have a triangle here, you do not know whether this triangle is little or is big. 
The shape is preserved, but the local scale is known. So what information geometry gives you is all the angles. It gives you the conformal geometry. This is great, because this is precisely what is needed for general gravity. I don't want to go very much in that direction, but more and more it is a conviction that the true dynamic of the recent freedom of gravity, the spin two excitations of the geometry, uh, are reflect the the conformal geometry, not the full geometry. I'll, I'll leave it there. But uh, then, then the question is, we humans do need notions of length. So how do we define length? Well, we look at our purposes, for the purposes of uh, surviving this world, and we say, we can define length so that uh, the physics looks simple. And the way we do it is we say, well, let us imagine that there are certain rigid bodies, for certain purposes, and we say, there is a rigid body, we call it a ruler, and its length is not changed when you move it around. We define that, and that seems to be very useful for, for everyday purposes. Things, the, the length of change of things do not change when you move them around. For other purposes, astronomical purposes, we may define the length of, 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 of space, the, those lengths, the local scales, in such a way that we have space now, three-dimensional, and space later, three-dimensional, and space later even three-dimensional, these spaces, three-dimensional spaces, sweep a four-dimensional space-time. That's the condition that is used in general relativity to, to fix what those scales are so that you generate a space-time. So, length is defined. Length, just like time, is defined so that the physics looks simple. It's up to us, post-Neander thought, uh, conglomerates of rulers to come up with conventions that make things look nice. Anyway, discussion. Uh, this, is, this is like a really weird one. Uh, BL is the information that measures distinguishability, right? So that you can distinguish one point from another. If that is case, the case, you can measure the length of a curve by counting distinguishable points, right? Just count. But if that is true, you can also count the area of the volume by counting distinguishable points. So it makes complete sense to say, oh, there are 17 points here, there are 13 points there, so this length is bigger than that volume. Oops. It allows us to compare the lengths of areas with the sizes of volume. Now, if you had said something like that when you're doing geometry in your, in your freshman year in college, they would have looked you to pieces, right? You can't compare But uh, here we have distinguishable points. This is very much as if space were discrete. It's not that space is a lattice. And clearly, I've been talking about continuous things. But in these models, there are certain features that makes that, that uh, makes space smell as if it were kind of discrete. So my conclusion is that in this kind of model of space, it is both, it, it has features that are contingent, and features that seem discrete. So it's, space is like both the best of both worlds, both worlds, it, it, it includes both. <coughs> so what is the, 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 the facility, the, 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 the ease with which we can do continuous calculations with some of the, the, the nice features of these three systems? Finally, we can figure out the statistical state of space. For each point, we have a probability so for the whole space, we have something that is on a product. If we assume that the whole thing is standard, this model I am assuming that. So for example, we can compute the entropy of space, if, if that could actually make sense. Very easy, the entropy of space is this probability star added that we are multiplying. The entropy is the sum of all the points in space. When you actually compute this, it's a Gaussian. We can do it, right? It's not a problem. Except for a constant, which is the entropy of a point, what I'm doing is I'm just adding over all the points in space. Just add the number of points in space in a, in a region, and multiply by the entropy of each point. You cut the total entropy of space, and what you cut here is the volume of the region. So, the information volume 
measure the number of distinguishable points. And also, separate constant, it measures the entropy of space, which is kind of amusing. I still don't know, don't, don't know what to make of that, but it, I, I thought it was good. Conclusion. We model space as a statistical manifold. We use the maximum in the tangent spaces and then the exponential math to assign the probability for the point. Information geometry, derived from the distributions, gives the conformal geometry of space. Length, if you really need a notion of length, is going to be defined so that this is too simple. Space has features of both continuous spaces and discrete spaces. Finally, the entropy of space is proportional to its volume. for the metric tensor at the top. Now what's confusing me is the coordinate x, which is the coordinate of the point x. Yes. But usually we would take that with respect to the Lagrange multiplier. No, the coordinate of the probability distribution. No, no, oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Ah, very good, very good, very good. Uh, when, 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 one typically, when one typically has a statistical manifold, uh, the statistical manifold, each point in the statistical manifold, we can use for its theta. And those, those parameters, theta, are parameters in the probability distribution, the probability distribution of x prime, right? Right. Now, typically, in a typical statistical manifold, the, the random variable, if you want to call it that, is completely divorced, completely separate from the parameters in the distribution. Uh, in, for example, the, the Boltzmann distribution, Theta, the parameter, has nothing to do with the energy states, right? And that would be the random variable, the, the, the energies of the various states, or things like that. Those two energies, or points, etc., have nothing to do with the parameter theta. 
In this particular case, and this is one of the clever tricks of the spoke construction, both those two are of the same nature. This is like a translation model. In translation models, what you said, you have one probability distribution, and the other members of the probability distribution are the same probability distribution, displaced. And so they are the same, the same type. Both variables are position variables. So this is unusual, yes, yes. Beautifully presented as well, as usual, uh, Ariel. So I have, I have one slightly silly comment and one more serious comment. Um, did you ever install the kitchen? This is your kitchen analogy. Like so, the kitchen, yeah. so the kitchen analogy, you go to the kitchen company and they have all this computer layout and three-dimensional design and all this sort of stuff. And then, then they send the guys with sledgehammers into your real kitchen. And they start sort of installing one cupboard from this side and one from this side, and there's always a gap. There's always so kitchen geometry actually is conformal geometry. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, this is very good. In, in my house, there are no right angles. <laughs> okay. Do we find? Uh, okay. Let me let me comment on your comment. Do we find? Construction problems with right angles not being right, or, or or with things don't don't fit. Oh yes, when I put the Riemann normal coordinates centered at one point, I have to be extremely careful because although the Riemann the Riemann exponential map can be extended in all directions as much as you want, uh, geodesics can actually diverging from one point can actually converge. And when that awful thing happens, the exponential map is still working, but that means that the exponential map construction is not a legitimate uh, construction of a coordinate system. So this construction will only work if my spaces are sufficiently smooth that for a sufficiently long distance, the exponential map gives me the coordinates. So that then I can fit the map from this region to the map from that region and patch it all up. So I have my couple coming from this way, and I have my kitchen sink coming from this way, and they have to match, and this is the kind of thing that keeps me awake at night, so, so that's not a <laughs> of pump. Yeah, yeah. And you're not even installing kitchen, so... Uh, yeah. I had to do a bathroom about a pump a month ago, and uh, that was a disaster. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Don't cut your tiles until the end. <laughs> so, uh, the, other, the other more serious comment, so I like the idea of a, um, a metric being a Lagrangian multiple. And so this then leads to the zeroth law. So you have one space with one metric, another space with another metric, you put them together, that from the zeroth law, those metrics should then merge into the same metric. Because it's so a Lagrangian model, it's just like equalization of temperature in the, in the terms of I, I wouldn't know how to put two spaces mm. together. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't claim that, okay. Okay, zero thought, zero thought, okay. I'm thinking fast to see if I can make sense of my own thinking here. Uh, the zero law has to do with the fact that if you have two systems, one is beta one and the other one is beta two, you put them in contact, heat will flow until, until you equate everything, okay? Now, is there something analogous here? I take one space, I bring it another place. Distances will flow? What will flow? Go through James and work out your general idea. That, that's right, but I don't think that there is an, a flow of, of, of metric or a flow. I, I, I wouldn't know what. Think of it's not a flow of temperature. temperature. It's not a flow of temperature, but it's a flow of heat. So it's not it's a, a conjugate, conjugate variable to whatever it is that you can multiply. Yeah, but I don't think there, there could be anything flowing here. It would be a flow of curvature. There is no dynamics on all of this yet. My, my point was to establish a subject matter, and then I will allow it to evolve. Hopefully, I'm lucky. Next year, I will have something, something to say about these things. Um, but right now, this is like the beginning. Uh, professor, you have a metric uh, for the probability space, and represent the curvature for the probability space. My, 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 I'm sorry, you have a, a, a metric for the probability space, um, 
is the curvature represent the curvature for the probability space. My question is: Is there some relation between the uh, metric and the prior? The prior that I use to determine those uh, to, to to figure out how to compute the calculus was essentially the idea that since the tangent spaces are nice and flat, it makes sense to, to, uh, to give equal probability to equal volume on that to those flat spaces and just choose this uniform. So, so, so and I, I would say I'm just, I'm just using the symmetry of the problem to assign, a, to assign priors that reflect that symmetry and just make it uniform. I, I don't have much more to say. So, perhaps taking general relativity, uh, I was traumatized with, with medication and counseling. I think I recovered it. <laughs> so, one of the things that we talked about was um, a formulation of general relativity which was independent of the choice of the metric. That is to say, true uh, more than three formulation of relativity. And that required the introduction of one forms.